Okay, we've been talking about how we got our Bible. And in the last segments, the last three, we introduced how to study the Bible. And that is the key. Many people have been saying, how can I put a Bible study together at my own pace, at my own rate? This inductor of Bible study is something that each and every individual that is a believer can do at his own pace or own rate. Uh, our particular book that we're going through is the book of Romans. Now, the particular passage that I'm unfolding is Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now, you know, for homework, we done did Romans chapter 5, right? And then also we'll be going over the rest of Romans chapter 3. Last time we were together, we talked about observation. And in observation, there are three, there are uh, components that we can look, look for. You remember that booklet that I had you? It got five W's. Who, where, when, why, and what. I think I got to hand you one. Uh, I think I got one in my bag. And those are some of the questions that you ask. Who is the author? Who is it speaking? What is the background? Or how? What is the time? Those things will help you in your observation. And you remember uh, also we went over the background and we also went over the background last time. When we went over the outline. All of that is entailed to help you, uh, you know, just like if you're at a play and in that theater, how would you know it's night or day or different season is because of the backdrop or the lighting. And that's what uh, interpretation and observation and uh, meditation, memorization, it continues to allow you to have that backdrop or the background to help you understand. Now, last time we talked about observation. Now, we want to talk about this. Step number two is interpretation. I N T E R. P-R-E-T-A-T-I-O-N, interpretation. Interpretation is the second step. When you interpret scripture, it is important to do your own work. Everybody understand that? It's important. Remember our last devotion is to study to show thyself approving to God that a workman need not to be ashamed. There are certain study tools you can use. Now, there are some people who will say, well, I could just read my Bible and that alone. That's arrogant and prideful because God is place pastors, teachers, and gifted people, scholars, to help us to understand the word. There are certain study tools you can use, but don't resort to commentaries at this point. We're talking about an interpretation. So uh, dig in and determine what the passage means. And that's what interpretation is. What does it mean as you go through the following steps? The first thing you want to see is, Underline key words, phrase, and define them in the terms of the context, what the passage is saying. Underline only the most basic and important words. You're not going to do every word, but as you read, there are certain words that stick out to you. Now, you will use a Bible dictionary. Remember we call that a lexicon, a concordance, or a word study book. And I'll share with y'all what type of word study book. Now remember, my passage is Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To who first? To the Jews first, and then to what? The Gentiles. So what am I presenting? I'm presenting to what? And who am I presenting it to? Both. Both, but who first? Jews. How do you know that? What did it say though? To the Jews first. first. So, if I was to interpret that in my words, Christ came to the house of Israel. So, when you see when Christ was preaching, he went to the house of Jacob and the house of Israel, which is synonymous with the Jews. And then he went to who? The Gentiles. Now, Paul's mission was to the Gentiles, but who did he go to first? Do you see how much that helped right there? So, if, if I was to pick that out, we went over this last time, I would pick out the word for, not, ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power, salvation, that word to everyone is one word, and that belief. So what is that word is saying? For, because, then, since. Not, nay, neither, never, no. Ashamed to have a feeling of fear, shame, with preventing a person from doing something. The, of the gospel, what is the gospel? Good tidings, good news, speak well. What is of Christ? Of Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One. Now, when it says the gospel of Christ, it is, it is 
with me, it remains. It's consistent. It has. What does it has? It has power. What kind of power? It has the might. It has the ability. It has the strength. What does it have the strength to do? It has the strength to salvation. What is salvation? Deliverance. The state of being saved. Not only are you saved, but you're being saved, but you're also safe. What are you saved from? The wrath of God. You're delivered from that. Well, who is it to? To everyone, all, every, each and all. But now there is a clause that believe. Is everybody going to believe? So those who entrust and have their faith, they will have salvation. So everybody is not going to have salvation. So the first thing is what? Key words. Look for those key words in the final. We're talking about interpretation. The second thing is you want to paraphrase it. After you checked out each word and then you underline the word and you defined it. Number two, paraphrase it. Paraphrase is spelled P-A-R-A-P-H-R-A-S-E. What do I mean by paraphrase? Put it back in your own words. Put it back in and regurgitate it. So if I read Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, right? To those who believe, to the what? Jews first and then to the Gentiles, correct? Now, these are back in my words. That word for Since I am unashamed of the good news of the Messiah, for it remains the might of God unto deliverance to all who who wholeheartedly entrust him, notice this, to the Jews first, and then it's presented to the Gentiles. Did you hear that? Who is it, who is it presented to first? The Jews, and then to the Gentiles. But you see how I put that back in my own words, but the only way I was able to put it back in my own words, as I highlighted observation, the word, then I interpret it, and then now I understand the meaning of it, now I'm able to put it back in my own words. You own it. And that's what the word of God say. Let the word of God dwell in us what? Richly. Let us meditate on the word of God. Let us memorize the word of God. Amen. So paraphrase. Put it in your own words. Each verse or the section of the passage. If this grow laborious, try putting the basic thoughts conveyed in a passage or a paragraph into one sentence. Try to get that unit of thought of what the writer is saying. This may seem like a lot of work. Amen. It is a lot of work. Can I get a witness, man? Amen. Amen. And for some people it is, but to force, what is it, what is it force you to do? It's force you to think. This is a book, right? Made up of words, sentences. <coughs> Causes us to think, but it forces you to think over the meaning of the passage. You can also see how people can misinterpret passages. But put it in your own words, a process that extremely is beneficial. Can we say it's beneficial? Greatly beneficial. You list divine truths or the principle or the verse, the paragraph, or the passage. Now, Romans 1.16, Paul was not ashamed to take the God's good news, even though the message had proved <coughs> excuse me, to be a stumbling block to the Jews, foolish to the Greeks, for he knew that it is the power of God unto salvation. He knew it did not rely on his own power, but whose power? God's power. That is, to everyone that believes, it tells how God, by his power, saves everyone who believes in the Son. This power stands equally to the Jews first and then to the what? To the Greeks or the Gentiles. Amen? So, the third thing you want to do, you want to list truths. Okay? I'm going to give you six. One. Listen to my truths. Is there a command that has been given in that passage, in that verse? Is there a command that has been given? And when you're doing your word study, how? The word imperative. If, if you, We're going to go over that later. An imperative or a command. For example, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. That's a commandment. Go and dip your... Self in the water seven times. That's a commandment. Number two, is there examples to follow? Well, in Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? 
So what am I to do? Preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Number three, is there some sin I should avoid? Well, the sin here, if I'm ashamed of the gospel, that's sin. The Bible is commanding us to be what? Unashamed. You see that? Is there a command God has given? Is there an example to follow? Number three, is there some sin I should avoid? Number four, is there a warning against false teaching of any kind? And that's why the epistle was read very heavily. And remember, we went over that last time. If you don't understand uh, about Judaizers, you can't understand Galatians or Colossians or 1 John. And we went over that already. Uh, is there any warning against false teaching? Number five, is there a basic doctrine truth about God? And we know in Romans 1.16, it is the power of God, his omnipotent power, his saving power. What about Christ? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is bringing the good news. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The good news is Christ came, Emmanuel, God is with us. A man who knew no sin took upon our sin. There's good news, we don't have to die in our what? Sin. Is there anything about the Holy Spirit, Satan, or man? Well, in man, we should share the gospel. And on the other part, we should be hearing the gospel. Why? Because if you're going to believe, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you. Number six, is there a promise for, from God to Christians? Is there a promise from God to Christians? Well, we know here in Romans 1.16, for the Christians who proclaim the gospel, it will be God's power. God's power is with them. Remember Matthew 28? Lo, I am with you always. Not only his presence, but his power is with the believer. What about, is there a promise to Israel, the church, or unbelievers? In this, Romans 1.16, for the unbeliever, if you believe in this gospel of Christ, you can be saved. And it don't matter what society structure you're in, Jews or Greeks. So, do we understand these principles? So, list divine truths. I gave you those. Paraphrase it, right? And then get keywords. And after you get keywords out of your observation, you're going to interpret it. Number four, cross references. As many truths or principles as possible. So, what you want to write down with cross references, as many truths or principles as possible. Do you find these same truths taught somewhere else? Uh, 2 Timothy 1 8. Now, here in Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of what? The gospel. So in it, we should not be ashamed, right? What did Paul tell Timothy? God did not give us a spirit of what? Fear. Fear, but a spirit of boldness, love, and a sound mind. Now I gave you a New Testament example. Now I'm going to give you an Old Testament example. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 46. I will speak of my testimonies. Testimonies is just like the word of God. Notice this. I will speak of... Uh, testimonies also before the king and will not be, notice this, ashamed of the word. What is the word in the Old Testament? The word of the Lord. His precepts. His concepts. The songwriter said he will not be ashamed. Wow. Psalms 119 verse 46, 2 Timothy 1 8. Use your concordance or Bible study tools to discover these truths. List at least one or two truths, but don't get bogged down. So just list one or two. Mine is mainly the gospel, Christ, and being unashamed, specifically unashamed. So, like, say if I was doing this, I would talk about the person, which is Jesus. I would talk about him being the justifier. So, person, and there was two statements up under the person. He is Jesus. And he is a justifier. You don't have to do like me and get bogged down in it because I can get a lot out of this verse. The, the, now, number one was person. Number two is power. And what, what are, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power, right? Now, what is the definition of power? Ability. So that would be my first one is ability. Second, we find that the power of God, which he has the ability to save and to change us. So we have ability. And then authority, authority, 
For I am not ashamed that the gospel of Jesus Christ it is the power of God unto salvation. He gives ability, but he gives authority to be saved. What is uh, the gospel of John 1 12? For as many as receive him, them he gave power, them he gave authority, them he gave ability. So, number one, the person, Jesus, justified. Number two, power, ability. What else? Authority. The last one is proclaim. What am I going to do with this truth? I'm going to proclaim it. You see that? Now, these last things I want to go over with you is tense, gender, mood, and voice. And we're going to go over that uh, a little bit. But just listen to this, and then if you got questions afterwards, just ask me. It's just going to take me a couple of minutes to read this. And then afterwards, if you got any questions on it, just ask me, okay? And then we'll get right back into Romans 3.23, and we'll be able to touch on this. Okay. Tense, a term that indicates the writer's descriptions of a verb aspect, portraying of its action or state or time. Aspect of the prior quality denoted by tense. Also, time is a secondary consideration and that it detects the mood of the verb. And we'll get into that. Don't, don't get too bogged down to it. What is one of the tense? Present tense. The verb tense where the writer portrays an action and the process. So if something is present, it's ing. Um, the perfect tense, the verb tense is used that the writer, something has already happened. Everybody understand that? Present, uh, perfect, emphatic. That is a participle attribute of prominence. When, when, when someone is yelling, that's an emphatic. When someone is saying something in bold, that's an emphatic. When somebody texts something in all capital letters, those are emphatic. You also have the imperfect tense, the verb tense, where the writer portrays an action that is in process or active. Also, you have gender. Gender is very important. Don't, don't think of gender as far as just male and female. Yes, those are the genders, male, female, and neuter, N-U-T-E-R. Let me, give you, let me give you an example. Remember when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Peter, right? Petros, right? He said, upon this rock shall I build my church. Now he just said the word rock. That's Petros again. So if we were to look in the originals, you see two Petros. But Peter is in the feminine. Now the truth, what, what Peter said, upon this rock, right? Shall I build my church? The Petros. This is what that is. It's in the masculine. The feminine is a small pebble rock. The masculine is a boulder. That boulder can't be moved, can it? But we saw Peter. He was thumped around. He denied Christ and so forth. Now let us continue on. The last one is, uh, no, we got moves and then we got voices. Just listen to this and then we'll go on. Uh, mood, the feature of, this is mood. We got gender, tense, and moves. Moves. I'm just going to go over two of them. An imperative and an indicative. The, the feature of the Greek verb that denotes the nature of the ver verbal ideal with regards to reality. That is, mood indicates whether the action of the verb is considered actually actual or only potential. The mood in the Greek, like for example, is imperative. Imperative is a command. The mood that normally expresses a command, intention, or exhortation. Like you exhort someone to do something. I encourage you. I beseech you. And indicative, the mood in which the action of the verb or the state of being is described as a writer, really. So, like say, if you look at Romans 1.16, God is telling us to believe. That's an imperative. But we cannot believe without the indicative, meaning the, the work of God. He's commanding us to do something, but we can't do it unless he do it. That's very important right there. Um, the, the voices, the relationship of the verb. So we got voices. Moves, gender, and tense. The last one. And it's a lot of other branches on it is. The relationship of the verb is subject. Voice concerns whether the action of the verb is directed towards a direct object. That's called active voice. If it's directing it to the main subject. Or you direct it to something like, like Christ saved us by his grace. Now it's being directed to us. That's passive. We're, we're not doing nothing. It's salvation unto God, right? Unto or through God. That's passive. We're passive. 
or whether the action is directed by the subject back to him. And that's the middle voice. It's something that he's doing, but he get all the glory for it, right? That's the middle voice. It's being directed back to him. Man, y'all ain't. To him, through him, for him. Come back. <laughs> yeah. Y'all got it? So, the word believe, and this is our last thing, and then we'll go into evaluation. Believe mean, remember my Romans 1, 16. That's my example. This is a uh, uh, pistuo. P-I-T-E-O-U-S. Pistuo. Carries the basic idea of entrusting. So, this is a verb. It's singular. That means it's a single focus. It's masculine, meaning that it's, you got to strongly believe. What do I got to believe in? The gospel. I got to believe in Christ. Uh, it's present. So I don't just believe that one time. Guess what I got to do? I got to continually believe that he's my savior and my redeemer. And then uh, active. This is a performance. Let me tell you something. We're not saved by work, but you better believe your faith got to work. Did you hear that? We're not saved by work, but you better believe that faith better work. If it's not active, it's a dead faith. Amen? So the gospel is affected because of God's omnipotent power. That's what it says. If you define Romans 1.16, it do not depend on man. It depends on the power of God. Based on his indicative, then he can command us. Amen? That's good news. 